So the October 12th meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. Welcome. I believe that we have a quorum. So we are doing this face-to-face -face and online. So if you give us a little patience when we're doing counting, not so much counting face-to-face -face because there are a few attendees, but definitely online. Um, senators may use the audio feature to ask a question or they may use the chat. Senators who raise their hand to speak will be recognized first. To raise your hand, click on the participant icon at the bottom of your screen and you should see the hand raise. We will start with the face-to-face -face audience and then the online participants. There will be a pause during voting to ensure we capture all the votes for both platforms. I also wanna note that if you have any questions for President Gee, you can contact university relations at mail.wvu.edu. Our first order of business is the approval of the minutes from our September 13th Senate meeting. The September 13th meeting minutes have been distributed as an annex to your agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none and seeing none in the chat, the minutes for the September meeting are approved as written. Next on our agenda is our report from Provost Reed. Thank you very much, Ashley. And it is um, a pleasure to see some of you in person today, a welcome change. Um, I have to say that um, with, you know, everything that's been going on and the COVID rates going down and the beauty of fall, it feels like we're almost getting back to normal. Um, and uh, as I stated in my email to faculty on Friday, our COVID situation has significantly improved since last year and even since the start of the semester. So I'd like to invite Vice President Rob Alsop up to the podium to address all things COVID. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me uh, here. So first, just an overall update on um, one of our biggest focal points, and that's vaccination rates. Uh, so on our Morgantown campus, um, we have now over 80% of our students who have certified that they, have, they are fully vaccinated, and 92.5% of our employees in our Morgantown campus um, um, have been vaccinated. And so, um, you know, the, the biggest thing I think we've learned from this pandemic and, you know, it's again, it's the, the marvel of um, modern medicine and American ingenuity that we have three vaccines within a year of the onset of the pandemic, which are safe and such a high level of efficacy that they have provide a huge amount of protection for those who have chosen to take it. And, you know, last year we had less than half or maybe a third of the amount of kids on campus, uh, 10 times as much activity, including full football games, up all night and a number of things. I think we all thought, uh, including me, that three weeks into the semester, uh, we would see a huge spike like we did last year and something we would have to navigate. Um, and that just just honestly didn't, didn't occur. Um, while a lot of the our state has had a lot of problems. Um, this institution and our community um, have weathered things relatively um, well. You know, back early this summer, I think I could have won a lot of money if I would have bet that um, we would have achieved a 70% vaccination rate, which was our target back in March and April. Um, and we've now exceeded those um, goals. And, and I think when you see the number of um, cases we've had on campus, it's reflective of that. Our vaccines are, these vaccines are incredibly safe and we encourage everybody um, to get them. You know, we continue to test, we continue to contact trace, we continue to do all of those things throughout the course of the semester as we've moved through this pandemic. Um, we're also talking uh, long-term about what this looks like as this pandemic continues. I think we'd all talked about how hopefully someday this pandemic will just be extinguished um, but we're now talking about whether this moves into an endemic, much more like the flu that we have to deal with on an ongoing basis. 
and how we do that thoughtfully as a university community. So we're not only thinking about um, how we're navigating this semester, but how we move forward long-term as an institution um, for that perspective. Um, and I think a number of institutions across the country are, are looking at that very question. Um, there are some external events that are unfolding that may have an impact on um, how we navigate this pandemic. And I just wanted to provide an update on a couple of those. Uh, President Biden did issue an executive order and I believe for institutions like us, um, as of December 8th, once federal contracts are amended or new federal contracts, there are in some instances requirements for those who are involved with that contract to be vaccinated. Guidance on that is coming out um, literally every day and posted on the website. And so our general counsel and team are working through carefully uh, the impacts of that executive order on our campus. Uh, and it may very well, and I suspect as time goes on, will dictate um, some level of vaccine requirement uh, in some instances to comply with those um, federal requirements. And we're working through those. We don't know the extent of it. At the state level, as you know, uh, Governor Justice uh, for a while has um, recommended a, a strongly encouraged policy as it relates to both masks and vaccines. Um, going forward, uh, the West Virginia legislature right now is considering a piece of legislation that would indicate that all state agencies and all entities that do business in West Virginia, that if you decide to require a vaccine, that you have to provide for a uh, religious and a medical um, exception to that mandate. Um, how those exceptions are obtained, um, they're rather broad. And so under the legislation, if you self-certify that because of your religious belief, you cannot take the vaccine and you are exempted. And then additionally, if a physician or a nurse practitioner certifies that you are, should not take the vaccination for medical reasons, you are also exempt. Um, a number of business groups, the Hospital Association, Chamber of Commerce, the Business and Industry Council have come out in strong opposition to the legislation, um, arguing that the exemptions should instead follow um, some provisions of federal law, which provide um, for different standards for obtaining an exemption from a vaccine mandate. So we're carefully watching um, how that unfolds. Moving forward, that legislation passed the House overwhelmingly. Uh, I think by everyone's count, it's a very close count in the state Senate. We'll find out more tomorrow as things move forward. Um, and I know um, that there's been a lot of talk about vaccine mandates on campus. So let me, let me just, just hit on that um, again, um, just quickly. We, we all share, I think, the same goal to get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can. And the question is, is how you do that. Um, and there's a couple of different ways they both can be effective. I uh, just got to note the hospital who has mandated it for their employees um, is up to a 95% um, compliance rate. So they still have about 5% who either haven't complied or who have obtained an exemption through their process. So we're at 92 and a half percent. It's a matter of, of how you wanna get there. And for us as an institution, um, given all things considered, we have gone for the strongly encouraged route. And we're very pleased that everybody has, has well, not everybody, <laughs> that most have responded by obtaining a vaccine. And so we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to monitor the landscape moving forward um, the, the, the last thing that I'll say on that, and then I'll just talk quickly on boosters is, you know, if, if we thought we needed to, for the safety of our community, mandate vaccines, and we thought that was the best way to go get the highest level for where we needed to go, we, we would do so. But in balancing everything, we think the strongly encouraging route has been successful um, and is the favored approach as we move forward. Just like we took a pause last year and went online for two weeks when we saw data that we didn't like, um, we'll, we'll do the same thing in following the data uh, moving forward. So finally, uh, I will um, say that, um, you know, most of us, I think, who got vaccinated on campus got the Moderna vaccine. Uh, we've been anxiously awaiting the approval of um, whether we need boosters if we obtain the Moderna vaccine. Uh, the FDA this past week indicated similar to Pfizer that if you're over 65, um, you are uh, immunocompromised or you are at high risk, which includes teachers and support staff, 
that after six months, you can get a Moderna booster. Um, the ACIP, which I've learned more about immunizations than I care to <laughs> know. The ACIP, which is a group of the CDC, which considers these things on the 21st is expected to take up the Moderna booster. Um, assuming they do so and they approve it similar to that, um, just like we did for Pfizer, we will have Moderna vaccine. I think it's on Mondays. Um, and so if you fit into the, one of those categories of high risk, uh, including teachers, immunocompromised, um, or over 65, and you've been six months, we will have plenty of Moderna vaccines for your booster and are excited about offering that additional level of protection um, moving forward. We're also excited and watching carefully, and this is important, now this will be the last thing I say as it relates to how we look at masks. And we know that there are a number of faculty who um, share concerns, particularly in the classroom, um, about taking um, at home to their kids who are under the age of 11 and can't become vaccinated. Fingers crossed and hopeful that um, at the end of this month, uh, the Pfizer vaccine will be approved for the five to 11 age group, um, which uh, will be great. I've got an 11 year old and I'm anxiously awaiting. We will be one of the first ones in line for that. And then additionally on the 20th, just so you know, we continue to monitor and review the data which is all trending in the right direction. Uh, 27,000 cases two weeks ago in the state, down to 9,000 today. But on the 20th, we will, we will have um, be in a position to talk about uh, mask mandates for the rest of the semester and where they will be required moving forward. Um, and, and any changes we are moving forward on that. So just as a heads up, that will come this week. Uh, we indicated to the community it would be October 6th. Uh, we did not feel comfortable with any changes to the mask mandate at that time. And so we said, give us two weeks and we'll talk again. And so we will be talking about uh, masks for the remainder of the semester uh, later this week. So I think that covers it. We're, again, grateful for the work that everyone has done. The masks we've worn and the vaccinations we've mostly received have made a huge difference in uh, the safety of our community. And so thank you for that. Thank you very much, Rob, for that report. So as we used to say in my old line of work in other news, um, my office is continuing to focus on academic transformation. It's an effort that we launched in January following President Gee's charge that we transform our academic, academic programming and practices to prepare our students for a changing world and to position our university for success now and in the future in a challenging higher education environment. As a reminder, we focused on three priorities in the spring semester. They were academic restructuring, instructional efficiencies, and program portfolio review. And today I'm gonna to focus primarily on, um, on the latter. So program portfolio review. Through a data-driven process, we identified 35 undergraduate majors or terminal master's degree programs as quote programs of concern, meaning they typically fell at the bottom of the fifth quintile in one or more areas of the gold standard criteria, such as enrollment, enrollment trends and student success markers. And we also looked at employment trends. Um, by the way, this, this did not include um, engineering, which uh, is going through ABET accreditation, and we will be reviewing um, engineering data um, at the end of the year. Through this process, we also identified 30 programs of opportunity, and these are primarily within our existing portfolio and those that demonstrated growth potential. We then asked the academic units to provide additional information and context to further inform our decision making. Our preliminary recommendations regarding programs of concern included to continue programs without any additional action required, to continue programs with additional action required, typically an improvement plan within a specific time frame, and finally to discontinue some programs. We then communicated our findings to the Dean's Office in each of the colleges. 
In turn, they had the opportunity to respond to and to appeal our preliminary recommendations through a formal appeals process that is outlined in the BOG rules. This allowed the academic units the opportunity to present their case one more time. Only two of the programs that were recommended for discontinuance appealed the preliminary recommendations. Those appeal hearings, uh, hearings were held on October 12th. In the case of one program, the appeal was approved. In the case of another, the appeal was denied. The final results of this process have been uploaded to the Ac Academic Transformation website, including the individual letters that we sent to each of the colleges. We really did want to be as transparent as, po as possible. It may not be perfect uh, the way that we did that, but we did want to make sure that, um, that those on campus who really were interested could see um, how the process worked. And we will be presenting our final recommendations to the Board of Governors on October 29th, so next Friday. A couple of things I want to point out. Um, one is that in the end, we recommended a relatively small number of programs for discontinuance. Um, and in fact, the uh, number of programs that we recommended for continuance with a specific action was greater. Um, and so the reason for that, I believe, is that we have already done a lot of this work already um, through the five-year BOG program review process. That process resulted in the discontinuance of 28 majors or programs over the past three years prior to academic transformation. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I really feel um, very excited about the fact that some colleges and departments have embraced academic transformation, and they're responding in very creative ways to the call for change. And to me, this is the absolute best part of academic transformation. And I hope what this process continues to inspire and encourage. It is always better to be the master of your own destiny than have others dictate your future for you. So speaking along those lines, moving forward this year, we plan to launch a new annual program review process that will be rigorous and ongoing, and that will require that colleges and deans regularly and departments uh, regularly review their own data so they can be proactive in responding to challenges and opportunities that the data reveals. And I would suggest that, um, that you might want to bring Lou Slimak to one of the future faculty meetings to talk a little bit about how this annual process will work. Right now, we're also reviewing the 30 programs of opportunity that I mentioned earlier, which include academic programs in our current portfolio that show growth potential. And we will be working with our deans to prioritize which of these programs show the most immediate potential and determine what resources will be needed to grow these programs. And we are also identifying um, our new priorities for the current academic year. And we'll be sharing those soon on our academic transformation website and at future faculty senate meetings. And we will continue to work with our various faculty committees, including the Academic Transformation Advisory Council, comprised mainly of faculty, to ensure that we are taking into account the faculty perspective and that we are being as transparent and as open as possible about what we're doing. We learned a lot in the first go around. Um, we didn't do everything right, but I think we will uh, be able to make some, some significant improvements to that process this year. At this point, we do believe that ac academic transformation will be a three-year process, but I also anticipate that we will be in a continuous improvement mode moving forward because we face tremendous headwinds in higher education and these challenges will be with us for a while. But I'm not depressed or deterred. I believe we have the talent and the tenacity as a campus to respond to these challenges, to build on our strengths, which are many, and to chart our own destiny, which will be based on best practices, but will also be unique to WVU. And that concludes my short report today. Do you, want to, do you want to read them or do you want to monitor them for me? Nope. Are there any questions for Provost Reed? Oh. Hi, Natalie. I'm Natalie St. Corcoran, Eberly College. And you know, I'm, I've got one ear, okay. so. 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so this is a, a, a comment, um, and this is regarding the state of the university address, and so I know that it might not be one that you can answer, uh, but I do um, want to say uh, uh, on behalf of my um, uh, colleagues that it's un unfortunate that we did not have the opportunity to ask questions of the president in years past, we have, uh, but uh, uh, there, there did not appear to be uh, the, the opportunity to do, to do that. And I'm sorry, I don't know why that happened, um, but I know that there that there's no um, reason why he will not answer questions um, after the fact. Thank you. Yep. I'm trying to read the chat. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm doing a very good job. Can you tell me if there are any questions? <laughs> it looks like we're okay. I think you're okay. I don't think there are any current questions in the Q&A or the chat. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Te I'm technology, technologically challenged. Um, thank you all so much and uh, have a good meeting. Okay. Thank you, Provost Reed. Just a reminder that we will hold coffee and conversation tomorrow at 10 a.m. This is not just for Senate members, but it's open to the entire faculty. The November meeting will include a presentation from Jody Goodman, our ombudsperson, a presentation with Amy Kittle, Assistant Director for Prevention and Education in the DEI office, and Associate Provost Melissa Latimer. They will be presenting on available resources, trainings, in the DEI classroom. Based on um, Provost Reed's recommendation, Lou Slimak will be attending our December meeting. I think he already um, knew that, but just for clarification, he is on the agenda. Just a reminder that the university is also requesting volunteers for the University Promotion and Tenure Advisory Panel for the 2021-2022 year. Reach out to Chris Staples if you are willing to serve. Please remember that if you are on the department or college level committee or being considered for promotion and tenure, tenure, you are not eligible to serve. Next up, we're gonna hear from Robin Hissom, the chair of the curriculum committee. Okay, thank you. Um, so today I have a few items for approval and a few items for information. Um, I'd like to start by saying that Annex 1, we had a request out of the Chambers College um, for a title change to the Farm 714 course. Um, it was a request to uh, distinguish it from the coursework that they have at the graduate level. That was uh, requested um, to Pharmacy and Pharmacy has agreed on that. So the new title uh, that will be moving forward will be Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship in Pharmacy. Um, and so with that, I uh, request approval for Annex 1 with that title change included. Are there any questions or points of discussion for Annex 1 with the new modification? Hearing no questions, we will move to a vote. All those in favor of approving Annex 1, please say aye or raise your hand if you're online. I probably need help counting. I feel like we should raise our hands perfect. as well. <laughs> Just everybody will raise their hand. Scott Wayne is going to be counting the votes online and posting those for everyone. This online and face-to-face -face format's a little clunky, so bear with us, sorry about this. We have 61 yes votes online, and it looks like we had, thank you. We have 10 face-to-face. Yeah. -face. <laughs> so we have 71 total yes online. Any opposed? We're just waiting for final count online. Uh, 
Ashley, it's still changing. I'm sorry, Scott, did you say 15? 16? Yes. Yeah, okay, we have 16 no. So the majority passes. Okay. Everybody for me, continue? Okay, okay so um, for approval, I also present Annex 2 with course changes and also a new program in sustainable design and development. And then I also have for your information two minors, one in sports coaching and the other in health coaching. And I'm happy to answer any questions on these items. Okay, so we will vote on Annex 2 in the new program in sustainable design and development. You have a quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. So we will be pulling out Annex 2 in the new degree program for a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. We have 10 face-to-face. -face. We'll wait just a moment for the votes online. So we have 55 yes online, 10 in person. If you could lower your hand. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Next up, we will have the, the question. The question has been brought up if we need to call a new vote for Annex 1. So we are going to re-vote on Annex 1 with the new modifications in place. All those in favor, please raise your hand. So we have 10, you can lower your hands here, 11. So I'm, I needed another hand to count. <laughs> Robin, will you share the modification again? We've not been able to hear the modification online. Okay, can you guys, can they hear me now? Yeah. So hopefully. Um, so the modification was to um, the farm 714. The title change will be entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in pharmacy. So making it specific to the pharmacy program. Uh, so there's not confusion with the entrepreneurial courses that are in the Chambers College. Okay, so the vote is for Annex 1 with the modifications. Please make sure if you have your hands raised that you understand that you're voting for Annex 1 with modifications. Okay, I call the vote. We have 58 online and 11 in person. Please lower your hand. Any opposed to Annex 1 with modifications? Okay, the Annex 1 passes with the modifications. Next up, we'll hear from Amy Welsh with the Jeffco Committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Jeffco has two items for Senate approval. The first item is Annex 3. It's the approval of course ULIB 301, Gender in the Research Process. 
approval for Jeff area for our society and connections area. Can go on to the set and our second annex is area I'm sorry, um, annex. just one moment please sure We're making <laughs> yeah, I did. sorry that's all right and there are some um some things going on in the chat here uh some folks want people to address the senate at a microphone, the folks online. And there's also some folks that have question, a question in the chat. So if you could please take a look at that as well, that would be great, thank you. Okay, it's been requested to make sure that anyone that is sharing any information in the room, they come to the podium or a microphone so that everyone online can be able to hear. And then it looks like the next question will be in regards to Annex 4. And Amy, you're not there yet. Right. right. Yeah. Are there any questions for Amy? Okay. So we are combining annex. We're going to combine the two items. For oh, okay. I haven't talked about, I can talk about Annex 4, and I know Rose also has a question about it if you want to combine okay. the two items. Annex 4 is um, revising our student learning outcomes for Jeff areas 4 through 7. Uh, the main purpose of this, a lot of the changes were pretty minor, but it was um, basically to create some clarity and to make these learning outcomes that, um, more easy to assess. Uh, Jeff area 6 did not have any student learning outcomes clearly defined, so those were newly created. Um, and I do know that one person, Rose, mentioned that she has a question. So I'm happy to take that question, Rose. Uh, yeah, Rose Casey, Everly College. Um, so one of my constituents reached out with concerns um, about both of these. Um, they're related, particularly about um, um, area five, but there's a question about area six too. So I'm just okay. gonna read what the person um, sent to me to try to be clear. Um, this person said it seems odd and inappropriate that the um, um, committee is proposing eliminating developing, uh, quote, developing analytical reasoning, apply methods of critical inquiry or expand problem solving skills, end quote, from area five, um, human inquiry in the past, because that's primarily history, philosophy and religion. And a related concern, so um, this was coming from someone in the humanities, um, a, a concern that in the um, new proposed learning outcomes for area six, arts and creativity, that there's nothing about critical thinking or analytical thinking. Um, and this is where um, English courses, for example, um, history, um, uh, no, not sorry, history, uh, uh, languages, um, count for general education along with music, literature and translation, film, theater, and the humanities. Um, so um, I'm wondering if it's possible to have something in there about um, critical inquiry, critical thinking, um, um, because it is uh, one of the fundamental aspects of um, study in the humanities, um, and it would be clearer um, and more accurate and also relevant for thinking about the case of the humanities in the university to have something in about critical thinking. Okay, thank you, Rose. I appreciate that. Yeah. I can give you a little bit of background that you can share with your colleagues about where we came from that, with that. So we were trying to keep these student learning outcomes relatively broad. And then we have those leap outcomes that you know, courses that do have critical inquiry and analytical thinking could then tie into those. But we were trying to keep these initial student learning outcomes more as a broad umbrella and then kind of tie into the things that exactly you mentioned that could be specific to leap outcomes for those specific courses. So that's Kind of our logic as we were developing these to kind of keep them as a broad umbrella to um, encompass the broad range of diversity in, of the courses within each of those areas uh, without excluding any particular courses if they don't meet critical right. thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, would there be, a, I, and I don't know how this would operate, but would there be a willingness to add in even just interpret and or critically analyze um, 
Yeah, we'd be so, happy to consider that. Yeah. Rose, I, Lisa DiBartolomeo, Everly College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I think one of the, as a person in the humanities, uh, I, I take your point, uh, but I think that those more general concerns about critical thinking skills and analytical skills are addressed in, in the more general introduction to the GEF rather mm -hmm. than figured into only one or two of the areas. I think because of the way the GEF is approached, the idea of critical thinking skills um, is infused into all of the areas rather than just into one of the areas as opposed to another one of the areas. So I think if, if your constituents go back and look at the overall description of the Jeff, you'll find that that language is in there. Uh, mm -hmm. It may not have made it into the more finite descriptions of the areas or the student learning outcomes because we were trying to be as efficient and as concise as possible, as well as being as measurable as possible. I also see another, oh, another question. Joe Hodge has, uh, were the disciplines involved consulted about these changes? So these were, uh, create the changes were brought about by the Jeffco committee and we have several of the, uh, the colleges are represented on that. Each discipline itself was not involved and consulted about these changes. So we did not contact each individual department, but we did have college representation um, when making these decisions. And then uh, there's a hand also raised. Have a question from Mark online. Okay, yep. Sorry, that was an accident. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions for Amy? We're going to pull these out. So we're going to vote on Annex 3 and Annex 4 separately. Are there any questions for Annex 3, Jeff Actions? Hearing no questions, we're going to move to a vote. All those in favor of approving Annex 3, please raise your hand. Got 11. <laughs> 11 face to face and we're waiting online. I call the vote. We have 53 yes online. If you would please lower your hands. Any opposed, please raise your hand. We have one opposed, Annex three passes. We are gonna now vote on Annex four. All in favor of passing Annex four, revised learning outcomes, please raise your hand. With 11 face-to-face. -face. I call the vote. 51 online. Please lower your hand. All opposed. We have six opposed, Annex four passes. Thank you, Amy. Next is our report from the Teaching and Assessment Committee Chair, Marina Galvez Peralta. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, from TACO, we, uh, we have a, been meeting um, as regularly. We have uh, launched the pilot project for the ESEI negative comments. You, if you were an instructor in the fourth semester, you might have received already an email from us. And this is a pilot for only the first, um, the instructor that teaches the first eight week block. So we will evaluate and adjust things accordingly for, for the full semester. 
we want to also thank all the faculty that are uh, participating in the early assessment. Um, and we will provide more summary data uh, as, as soon as we, we compile all that. Thank you very much. I am happy to address any questions. Okay, Marina, thank you. Next, we'll hear from the Committee on Committees, Anne-Marie Hibbert. Anne-Marie Hibbert, Chambers College. I have one, we have one approval item, Annex 5, changes to three standing committees. I'm happy to take any questions. Looks like we have no questions. All those in favor of Annex 5, please raise your hand. We have 11 face-to-face. -face. I call a vote. There's, we have 55 yes. If you could please lower your hand. If you could please lower your hand. All those opposed? We have one opposed, Annex 5 passes. Next up, we'll hear from our faculty representative to state government, Eloise Elliott. Thank you. Um, I just realized it says approval of the legislative agenda. So um, did we include that as an attachment? Yes. Okay, the um, ACF has uh, put forth the legislative agenda for all the colleges and universities to approve. Um, it has been approved by the Faculty Senate Executive Committee. So um, leave that to you. Any questions for Eloise? Will you go to the microphone? Thank you. Frankie Tech College of Education Human Services. I was just wondering, I don't see campus carry on there and I know that's sort of a, it may not be an agenda for legislation, but are we continuing to watch that issue and have it on our radar again for this session? Thank you. Uh, yes, it is included in one of the more broader um, agenda items. As you'll look at those, you'll see they're pretty broad and, and I don't have them in front of me, so I'm not sure which one that is. I think it's it might be number six, but we are looking at that as one of the major agenda items that we need to be concerned about in this legislative session. Any other questions? Um, I will say that the other two items that we really have our eye on is, um, first of all, the, um, um, I've already forgotten what they are now. Can't, um, oh, thank you. Well, no, I don't need that. Uh, is looking at the budget and um, how that's going to be, um, the new funding formula will affect us and campus carry and also we're concerned about what's going to happen with the critical race theory. Okay, so all those in favor of Annex 6, please raise your hand. 11 face-to-face. -face. Call the vote. We have 53 voted yes. Please lower your hand. All those opposed? Looks like we have no opposed. Annex six passed. 
Our next report will be from Stan Heilman, a representative from Board of Governors. Uh, the board met on September 17th. We received several reports, uh, one from the foundation on fundraising and investments, another on academic transformation, uh, one much like Rob gave today on COVID-19, and then an update on university finances from Paula Congilio. Uh, the one action that we did take was to renew the emergency leave plan. That is for vaccinated individuals only. Um, we have a special meeting actually this Thursday on the 21st, the Finance and Revitalization Committee. And then the next public meeting will be on October 29th. And that is my report. Any questions for Stan? Hearing none, we will move to new business. There is a new resolution to be presented. Jared Sims will be introducing this resolution. Note that this resolution is being presented during the Faculty Senate meeting and will only need a vote from the Faculty Senate, not the University Assembly. Hello, just one moment, please. Now we're adjusted. Um, this is gonna take a little bit of background um, first of all, my name is Jared Sims, and I'm from College of Creative Arts. Um, many of you, if not everyone knows, we had a faculty assembly several weeks ago and a vote about a vaccine mandate for WVU students and employees. And of course, the vote indicated that 85% of WVU faculty are in favor of vaccine mandate. I got contacted by the faculty senate chair at West Liberty University, who asked for a copy of the resolution, and they passed it at West Liberty voting in favor by a three to one margin. Marshall also invited, uh, they also voted and it was also a, a huge margin of favor of a vaccine mandate. Last Thursday around noon, Mary, Mary Beth Beller at Marshall University contacted me about a joint resolution between us and Marshall. I made some edits to what I'd submitted before, added Marshall to the document and shared it with her. Then by 5 p.m. that day, Marshall University's faculty senate debated it, made two amendments to what I'd sent, and then voted over, overwhelmingly in favor of a vaccine mandate. And by virtue of the rules of their faculty senate, the president of their university will formally have to sign to acknowledge he received the recommendation. So the document that I've shared with you is the resolution that Marshall approved and it's my understanding that we will take a vote. So uh, I will read it and I think everybody has a copy, yes. Um, so this is a joint resolution between Marshall University and West Virginia University. Whereas the faculty Senate affirms the value of an in-person residential experience at Marshall University and West Virginia University. Whereas the faculty assembly affirms the value of offering educational opportunities in healthy classroom environments. Whereas, according to the Chronicle Education, at least 1,066 campuses have implemented vaccine mandates for students and or employees. Whereas Marshall University and West Virginia University faculty wish to avoid interruptions to in-person activities due to COVID-19 disease outbreaks. Whereas the mental health of many of our students, faculty and staff is severely at risk if in-person activities are limited or suspended due to COVID-19 outbreaks. Whereas the Food and Drug Administration has granted full approval, approval of the Pfizer by IonTech COVID-19 vaccine as insurance that it prevents COVID-19 disease in individuals 19, 16 eight years of age and older. Whereas the WVU Health System, Marshall Health, and the Joan C. Edwards School of Medicine have mandated that all employees receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Whereas in the interests of a safe and healthy campus community, Marshall University and West Virginia University have an existing policy that requires students to be immunized against MMR, meningitis, polio, tetanus, and hepatitis B. Whereas the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine is free and easily accessible, therefore be it resolved that the faculty Senate supports mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations for all students and employees by January 1st, 2022, with legally mandated exceptions, we so resolve. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Are there any questions?
Okay, we will take a vote. There is a, actually, um, there are a few questions. Julia, Some I can't see the questions. questions. Um, they uh, had their hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Harvey's. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, you guys are doing a great job as a university, as everything. Um, my only comment Harvey's, is- what Hang on just one second. It looks like we need a second to be able to discuss this. So I can call for a second. Do we have a second to go into discussion? It looks like we have a second. Sorry, Parviz, I apologize. No, no problem. Thank you. Um, um, to the, uh, yeah, uh, the only, um, we have a representation at Board of Governors. Parviz, I'm going to interrupt you one more time. We're, we can't hear you face in the face-to-face -face room, so we're going to work on the audio. Just one moment, please. Uh it's up as much as it can. So Parviz, I'm not sure if you can turn your mic up, but then we'd be able to hear you better. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, Parviz. I can put I can put it in the chat, but my pro my my point is we're effective as as long as our representative at our two universities, board of governors are effective. That's all. If it doesn't make it to the agenda, how can we you know, talk about it? Thank you. Parviz, it was introduced as a new item in new business. Looks like Louisa has a question. Louisa, do you have a question? Nope. Okay. It looks like there's no response. Are there any other questions? All those in favor of the joint resolution, please raise your hand. Okay, we have eight face-to-face. -face. I call the vote. We have 48 yes online. Please lower your hand. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay. I call the vote. We have eight opposed and any abstentions. We have three face-to-face. -face. We have four, four online. Do I need to do anything else? That's it? Okay, it looks like the joint resolution passed. If, is there any other new business? Is there a motion to adjourn? Do I have a second? All those in favor? Thank you. Have a good afternoon.